Hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live Peer Exchange titled Perspectives on Systemic Therapy for Breast Cancer. As we've now headed into 2018, it's a great time to reflect on the important advances that continue to shape the way we treat our patients. In this Onc Live Peer Exchange discussion, I am again joined by an expert panel of renowned breast cancer oncologists. Today, we will discuss the research that was presented recently at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. We'll review the key abstracts and provide perspective on how the data may influence the future of clinical practice. I am Dr. Adam Brufsky, and I am Professor of Medicine and Associate Division Chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Participating today on our very distinguished panel are Dr. Francisco Esteva, Associate Director for Clinical Investigation and Director of the Breast Cancer Medical Oncology Program at the NYU Langone Perlmutter Breast Cancer Center in New York, New York. Dr. Kamal Javeri, attending physician, Department of Medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, New York. Dr. Hope Rugo, Professor of Medicine and Director of Breast Cancer Oncology and Clinical Trials Education at the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center in San Francisco, California. And finally, Dr. Lee Schwartzberg, Executive Director of the West Cancer Center Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis, Tennessee. Thank you so much for joining us and let's begin. So the first thing really guys to talk about is hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And you know, it's kind of nice that we have a lot of really uh, interesting drugs uh, that we use now, in particular the CDK4-6 inhibitors in metastatic disease. And I think we'll start, I think, with ribocyclin. Um, Lee, what do you think about ribocyclib right now? I mean, where do you think it stands in terms of the other CDK4-6s? Well, we have three CDK4-6 inhibitors, and they all look very effective in treating postmenopausal women uh, in the first or second line setting with uh, endocrine therapy, in combination with endocrine therapy, either with an AI or with uh, fulvestrin. So we have, from San Antonio, the Mona Lisa 7 study, which looked at premenopausal, perimenopausal women who were treated with ovarian function suppression plus uh, an AI or tamoxifen plus ribocyclib. And uh, that was a, a very nice study because that was a segment of patients that we hadn't yet uh, formally looked at in a clinical trial setting to see if they would get the same benefit. We had it in the later line with uh, fulvestrant in Paloma 3, but we didn't have a full study looking at first-line patients who had not been endocrine resistant in the premenopausal women. And that study showed very similar results to what we've seen with the other first-line trials. Uh, a hazard ratio of uh, about 0.55 and about a 10-month, 11-month improvement in disease-free survival. So I think the results are incredibly consistent. I think the results across all the first-line trials are incredibly consistent. And I think now we have another option that is formally uh, clinically trial tested for premenopausal women to use ovarian, ovarian function suppression and an AI. So Kamal, I mean, is this something new? I mean, aren't we all doing this anyway in practice? I, I have you been doing it in practice at Memorial? Absolutely. So I think we did have data, as Lee pointed out, I think in the Monarch 2 with abemaciclib and fulvestrin and in um, Paloma 3 with fulvestrin and pavociclib, where we studied subsets of premenopausal women. And if you looked at the subgroup analyses for benefit within premenopausal and postmenopausal women, both derive equal benefit. But this is the first time this is a dedicated study of over 670 patients for pre- and perimenopausal women. And the very first, I think, that also looks at tamoxifen as an That's endocrine partner. That's the big partner. deal. I think is the big deal. Right. right. And so I think it's encouraging to see another endocrine partner with tamoxifen. Now, one could theoretically say, could we looked at uh, tamoxifen with the CDK4-6 inhibitor without the ovarian su suppression as um, you know combination, but I think our first line treatment option for premenopausal women has been ovarian function suppression based on the five trials that we've studied and uh, the meta-analyses that we have. So I think this was an appropriate treatment arm with tamoxifen and ovarian. You know, function. I think that it's a it's a nice thing to be able to consider tamoxifen for these patients, but. Also, the other part of it is that, you know, a lot of times people think you have to take the ovaries out of these patients. It's so hard, you know, young women, metastatic cancer, you know, incurable disease. 
And now, you know, we know we don't have to take the ovaries out. That's a really big difference, I think. And hopefully it'll be incorporated into future trials because I know for my patients, it's very frustrating for them to understand that they could only participate in the trial if they had their ovaries out rather than getting the injections. So hope you wouldn't give them an injection, you do nothing? No, 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 I would do the LHRH right. agonist. The issue was that the way the trials were set up, they, you had to have your ovaries out if you were going to participate yeah, right. in Mona right. Lisa, Paloma, right. Monarch. And so, and we kept saying, but we use GnRH agonists all the time and it works. Right. And this now shows it does work. And they saw the same impact. That's I thought was really important. So let me ask you guys a question, just kind of parenthetical before we go back to this. So we all know, we teach the fellows this, right? You know, the first thing you do in a premenopausal woman with metastatic disease, you make her postmenopausal, by and large, right? Most of us would agree with that. Right. And our guidelines. You're kind of shaking your head. Well, you don't you agree with that? You can use tamoxifen alone, and uh, now with ribocyclib, you can extend. So you can use tamoxifen. You would use tamoxifen ribocyclib without LHRH. In, in patients who are with me metastatic disease. I think in the palliative setting, it's acceptable to use tamoxifen alone. You can use, if you use tamoxifen plus an AI, or I mean plus a LHRH agonist, the response are higher, but the, the, there are more side effects. So I think it's still an option if you want to do that with, for example, ribocyclib. Um, we, well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push it a little bit further. So you, ha you have a woman who's progressing, so you put her on, you know, LHRH, ribo, and letrozole. Nice therapy, good therapy, or tamoxifen and letrozole, either one with LHRH. It's now a year later. How many of you would do an estrogen level on that woman? I wouldn't. You would not, would you, Francisco? Who would do an a what? An estrogen level. I, I, I do them all the time. I do them all the time, but and I, I think this is important. Right, right. Yeah. and we're gonna get to this a little and later when we talk about estrogen. And I use the estrogen therapy. ring, so I check, definitely check estrogen. I, that's a whole other discussion. But no, seriously, you would not, why not? I, I, I thought you were trying to say whether we need to continue LHRH and that's what you were going with this, but sounds like you're I'm going, going to how many are resistant. Correct. That's what I'm asking. Right. So then for that, I would definitely want to check and know whether we're actually suppressing it, especially when giving AI with LHRH. Yes. Right. Because it's our, less so with tamoxifen. Exactly. What, what I find but our prostate it, colleagues yeah. who give LHRH all the time, maybe it's different in men and women, I don't think it is, but 25% of the time it's not suppressive. But we, we know that from the adjuvant trials. That, Correct. We're we'll going to talk about that in a few minutes. Right. But we uh -huh. know that in, in premenopausal women where we're giving uh, GnRH agonists that most patients suppress, not 100%. Right. And so you have to check estradiol. If you don't check the estradiol, you don't know what you're doing if you're giving an AI. If you're giving tamoxifen, it doesn't matter so much. You're exactly. Just, you I think know, blocking about 16 percent don't really suppress their estradiol yeah. levels. Right. But if in the context of not having any vaginal bleeding, I think sometimes community doctors or other doctors don't necessarily think it is important to check, but I think you bring up a great point that we should. But the bottom line is what I'm trying to say is, yes, we don't take their ovaries out, but what we should be doing, especially those. if you're gonna use the Mona Lisa regimen now going forward, is you gotta be careful about their estrogen level, right? Especially if they progress. Because it'll be a year later, some people will progress, they'll go, oh, they're resistant to the LHRH. No, and totally agree. You know, when it's just an estrogen issue. Even if they don't progress, if you're using an AI, you should check it periodically. Yeah, because especially very young women, you right. know, it's a, closer to perimenopausal, it's one thing. Right. The ovarian function is not as strong. Right, we're going to get into that, I think, a little later when we talk about adjuvant therapy, but I just wanted to bring that up.